Hello, and welcome back to Puzzle Collection. Today we're doing probably the most complicated of all of the puzzles in the Puzzle Collection. So we are going to be doing Painting Restoration. Let's just give a quick demonstration of what this puzzle is about. So here I have two grids. I've got a 6x6 blank canvas on the left, and I've got, uh, excuse my mouse for this, we have a 6x6 on the right. Every time I hit the OK button, Z, I paint with that pattern. And I have to get the left side to look the same as the right side. Now, if I overlap blue plus blue, two, you get a red. If you overlap again, it goes away. All right. So I'll just quickly demonstrate how this kind of works out. This one's pretty simple, but kind of like that. And as you can see, it's a lot of events. All right, so before we get into it, let's look at what we have going on here. We are going to need four switches, technically only three. Uh, we have whether or not we are currently paid painting. We have a switch to tell the thing that we're updating. We have a switch to tell the thing that we're resetting. Uh, by update, I mean you painted something and then it needs to redraw it. And then finally, the fourth one, which is optional, is solving the puzzle. I just have that set so the spikes know to go down and the uh, sparkle on the wall goes away so that you can't re-trigger the puzzle once you've beaten it. Variables. Well, our friend the region ID makes another appearance. Uh, we're reusing the same variable as the statue part, the uh, tile sliding puzzles. That's fine, but we will be using region IDs. That's what they look like here. And this is very, very specific, these numbers. Uh, I will explain that when we get into it. Cursor X, cursor Y. So this fire thing, which is our cursor, we need to track where it is, because obviously when we do the action button, we want it to know where to put the paint. And then finally, our last variable is how many mismatches are in the painting. So when we look at these two paintings to start, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 tiles here, 17 squares, that need to be changed in order for this to match this. So this is how we check whether we're complete or not. We're going to start the mismatch variable at 17 in this case. And then every time we make a match, we subtract one. And every time we add something where there shouldn't be something, we add one. And that way it's always going to end up greater than zero unless it is a perfect match. And if it's a perfect match, it'll be zero. And that's how we can know that we're done. Finally, we also have three common events. And that's uh, three is because I've, I'm doing this with three colors. I've got the default blank canvas, which I'm calling green, and then I've got blue and red. So we have three different colors, and each of those we need a common event for. Technically, we don't need this, but this will make your life a lot easier when it comes to copying out these events, because changing all these numbers in, I guess, 36 different codes, 36 different events here is kind of tedious. So using common events can drastically reduce your workload. It's still going to be somewhat tedious, but this is better than it otherwise would be. So let's look at those common events. So if we go into our database here, common events. And what we have here is it's just going to be checking to see whether the paint check, which is to say, uh, right, so paint check is the variable I call for this mismatch. So paint check is saying, here that we add one if we make a mistake. We do nothing if we're going from a mistake to a mistake. Uh, and we subtract one if we're doing something good. So th there's really three possibilities uh, for each color. So we either go from the wrong color to the right color, the wrong color to the wrong color, or the right color to the wrong color. And that's what these variables match up with here, and then the self switches will make more sense once we get into the event itself. 
Uh, but anyway, I recommend um, just getting these set up in advance. So I guess I'll quickly explain how this works is going to work out in our actual uh, puzzle event. Uh, self switch A is blue, self switch B is red, and if we don't have A or B on, then we get green. Then these jump to labels just skip everything else once you've found something. So if you find blue, you're done. If you don't find blue, you check here. If you find red, you're done. If you don't find red, then you check green. And that's how that works. Also, technically, I don't need these plus zeros in here. That's just to make it um, make sense here. And then you can see that these values change. So the way this works is what well, we're going to be calling this if we want to check the square is supposed to be green, is it actually green? So if it's actually green, minus one, right? That's getting us closer to zero. That's our check that we want. If we've gone from green to blue, that's not good. It used to be okay, but it's no longer okay. So we add one. If we're going from blue to red, well, wrong is still wrong. So we don't need to change the variable. And it's the same for all of these. So for blue, um, if we're switching from red to green, don't care. If we're switching from green to blue, that's good. So minus one, switching from blue to red is plus one. And finally red. Here, switching from red to green is bad. So that adds one. From green to blue, we don't care. And from blue to red, that's good, minus one. So that's how the common events work. All right. We also need to initialize some things before we get into it. So let's go over here. And I just uh, I wanted to show the common event stuff before we get into this, because I will be building everything else. But the common events are already built, and I'm not going to be building those. I'm just going to assume that we have those working. So yeah, you can go back and look at those if you need the, uh, the information on those. All right, so entering the puzzle. This, you're probably going to have a transfer event coming into it. Uh, my library scene is a little bit weird because I have I have this off screen, so to speak. So if you're running around in here, uh, the camera will follow you. But then if you touch this, you teleport to here, and then you see this. Uh, it's probably easier to just have a totally separate scene. So you touch the thing to start the event, and then it just teleports you to another scene where you have your puzzle. That's the, the method I recommend actually doing. So that's what we're going to do here. So we're going to assume that we've done that and that we've arrived here. So let's go with our event. Player. Okay. So we have just teleported in here. But in our teleport event, let's call this entrance. In our teleport event, we transferred in, but there's a few things that we want to do. First, control switch. Painting. On. This is so that the cursor, that little fire thing that shows where you are, will not be active unless you are actually in the puzzle. The fire does not exist if you're not in the puzzle. So that's what this is for. Then we have to set some of our variables to default values. So we're going to set cursor X and cursor Y to 1. And this is saying that our fire cursor selector thing is in the top left corner of our grid. So X is 1 and Y is 1. That's top left. And then finally, control variable, paint check. And this is going to be how many differences there are. So as you can see, I don't actually have, um, I don't actually have a thing written in here because I want to show a recommendation for how to do that. I basically recommend getting it set up and then you paint some, you paint a pattern here to confirm that the pattern you're painting is possible because it might not be if you just do it arbitrarily. But if you actually get the scripting working and then you get the pattern drawn here, take a screenshot of that and then create that over here. And that will be something that you know is possible to make. There's nothing more frustrating than playing a puzzle game where the developers threw in a puzzle that's not actually possible. You don't want to do that. So for now, paint check. Uh, we'll just set this to 10 so that it never triggers because at best we're going to be able to get it down 9. And finally, uh, we're just going to go auto-run on this one. 
And I guess then we have to do control self switch. New event page, self switch. Okay. And that's just so that. Um, this is sort of simulating we've transferred from a different scene. These are all the variables that have been set up. And then this is just so that the auto run isn't running continuously because this wouldn't actually be an auto run. This would be the transfer from the previous scene. Uh, this is just kind of faking that behavior. So that's not actually important. All right, so that's our entrance to the puzzle. Cursor, this is, well, it looks like the most the most work. Um, the painting squares are definitely more work, but this is uh, quite a bit of work here too. So let's start with our event. And this is going to be running in parallel. It is constantly running. Uh, switch is painting. So it's not actually constantly running. It's only running when we are in the puzzle, which we've already set that switch for, so that should be fine. Uh, options, walking, stepping, direction fix. We're going to do all of those so that we have a nice animated fire, which is going to matter. Look at flame. I think this is what I used. So direction fix means that when we're going up and down, we're not going to be, you know, up, down, left, right, we're not going to be switching. Because if you see people here, um, that's, there we go. So you can see that the direction changes depending, like the row you're in depends on your facing. We don't want that. We just always want to be in this row of three here. So that's what direction fix takes care of. And then walking and stepping just tells it to animate between those three, uh, those three images. So we get a nice little flickering flame as we're going around. All right, and that is all of that set up. I think I also set this to above characters. It doesn't actually matter, I don't think, but that's what I did. All right, and the cursor, all we care about is, well, first of all, um, we've, gone, we've come this far, painting is working. Let's just make sure that this is actually cre creating the way we want it to. We, the way we want it to. Okay, we have a fire. And we are not fro uh, we're not frozen. Right, that's an issue. Um, that's a kind of a weird thing about the way that this is set up. So I guess I'll just show a quick fix for that, which is also something I did over here, which is what these are. Uh, we're just gonna create an event here. Walker. It doesn't do anything, but it is the same as the character, and it's an action button. Okay. So now Try to, go, try to go up, it doesn't actually matter. The other three sides work just because of how the auto map, the auto tiling works, but the up is not actually a collision because we don't have a wall. This is just, it's just the way that this, this thing works. And yeah, you can see our flame is flickering. Excellent, okay. So now we have to give it inputs, down, left, right, and up. We'll get movement happening first. Now, the easier way to do movement would be to do uh, set movement route. We've done this before. This is really handy. The problem with set movement route is that every single one of these squares is going to be an event. And you cannot have an event move on to another event. So to get around that, we're not going to be moving into the events. We're going to be teleporting onto them because you can do that. So this is sort of a workaround. Also, we need to be calculating the cursor's X and Y position anyway. So this is probably uh, probably a good thing to do. All right, so we'll just do it this way. Uh, conditional branch. If uh, button, and uh, we'll start with down, is being triggered. Being triggered means when you first hit the button, whereas pressed is just going to continuously Continuously go, so you push the button and it might trigger the same thing a whole bunch of times in the space of a couple of frames. Unless you're able to press down the button for exactly one frame. Um, at least I assume that's what was going on. Uh, changing this from press to trigger fixed a lot of issues, uh, and I assume that's why. All right, so we pressed down, we've pressed down, it's been triggered. Now we have to set our variables. We're going to set X. Uh, we'll just set these both to zero for now, just to fill in the block of code. There we go, x and y both equal zero. 
Now, how do we actually determine what we want the default x and y values to be? Well, top left x minus 1, top left y minus 1. What does that mean? Well, down here, you can see your current position. This square is 0, 0. So the top left is 4, 2. 4 and x, 2 and y. So we want to go with, oh no, now I'm looking at this and I'm not entirely sure. Hold on, I'm just going to confirm that this is actually right. So here we have 2 and 15. If I go in here, it's 1 and 14. Okay, there is a... One and fourteen, right? Okay, I remember. I remember why that that works this way. This is a yeah. This is a consequence of the the teleportation. Okay. Uh, whoops, that's not the one we want. Right. So we have four and two. So we're gonna go x is three and y is one. And what we're actually doing here is we're adding three to x, and we're adding one to y. Oops, add. And that's because we've defined our top left square as 1, 1. If we had defined it as 0, 0, then we would be in the same coordinates as the screen itself. So that's where the, the offset is coming from. I'm choosing to define this as 1, 1, and this is 3, 3. Like 1, 2, 1, uh, 1, 1, 1, 2, etc. But because this is from 0, 0 instead of from 1, 1, we get that little bit of offset. So this is just how I did it. Um, it makes the rest of this easier, but it makes this part conceptually a little bit confusing. All right, if conditional branch, cursor y. So this is, what we're checking here is when we push down, we don't want to be able to go outside of this three by three grid. So that's all that this is checking. So if cursor y is, and then we want second last row's y. Okay, so we've currently added one to it. It's fine. So second last row is going to be here. Y value is three. So we want less than or equal to three. This is when we're allowed to increase cursor Y by one. All right, so if we're not at the bottom, pressing down moves you down. And then finally, here we're going to move the event, uh, set event location, this event, and designate with variables, cursor x and cursor y. And this is why we have to have these as separate events, as separate variables. All right, looks good. Well, we're just going to be doing this a whole bunch of times. So let's just copy this three times and then go through this process again. So we have left, I'm just gonna get these done, and then we'll go through them once they've been labeled. Okay. So left, right, and up. So if we're going left, uh, this is gonna be the same in every single case. So we don't need to change this, but this is the part that's gonna change. So in this case, instead of Y, uh, no. Instead of y being the issue, now x is the issue. So we don't going left, we want to not move if we are lower than five. So if we are greater than or equal to five, our cursor x greater than or equal to five, then cursor x is allowed to be reduced. And then this is going to be the same. All right, going to the right is going to be the same here. Same same issue again. However, this time we're actually looking at if our cursor x is less than or equal to 5, right? Because this is the same same row. Also, I guess I should probably have mentioned this, but it's pretty obvious. Now, this is a 6 by 6 which there's a lot more puzzle potential for when, with a larger grid. However, it also takes a long time to copy out all these events. So for the sake of this tutorial, I'm just doing a 3x3 three three because this will be 
much more reasonable to get in video. Don't want to watch me copy the same events 36 times. All right, so anyway, yeah, here we are. So right is going to be less than or equal to 5. And if that is the case, we can add 1 to x because we're going to the right. And up, these are the same. Y, so less than or equal to 3, but in this case, for Y, we want it greater than or equal to 3 because we're not in the top row. So we switch the sign here, greater than or equal to 3. And Y can go down by 1. All right. Uh, let's just look over here and make sure that I did the thing I was supposed to do, because otherwise this will be confusing. Actually, this is kind of confusing to look at anyway because of how I wrote this out. So, well... Let's just run it and see what happens. Okay, that's uh, not good. Something weird is going on. I forgot to put something important in here. I'm supposed to... like this plus three and plus one. This is um, to deal with the offset, the fact that we're not in the top left corner. But once we have sent event location, we're supposed to subtract those. I think I just forgot to put that in my notes. Yeah, subtract them here. Okay. Well, that's an easy enough fix. This is why you test things. So we're going plus three and plus one, and after we move, we want to subtract instead of adding. And this just gets our offsets working properly. And then after this event, we're just going to copy this in here each time. So if we test this, Uh, so that seems to be working. Uh, another thing, we notice that we're starting off a little bit. I'm just going to fix that real quick. In our transfer event, set event location, I guess this would be a reason why you would need to be in the same. Uh, in the same event, there's, there's various ways you could do this, but I'm just going to deal with it that way. Uh, alternatively, yeah, so now it starts here. Alternatively, you could just have uh, another page in the cursor that just auto runs when you enter the scene and then moves there. That's probably the better way to do it. All right, so cursor is done. Cursor is working. However, we have other functions that we want in the cursor. OK button and also a reset button. A reset button is important because without it, you're actually trapped in the puzzle and you can't get out the way I've set this up. Um, that might be okay if you're having a very linear game where you just do a puzzle and once you complete it, you go to the next puzzle. But assuming that you're doing an actual RPG, you know, RPG Maker, and you're running around doing quests and stuff, something like this, you probably don't want to trap the player in. You want to let them leave if they decide that they don't really care about the treasure chest or whatever it is that they're going to get for solving this. All right, so um, let's start with the OK button. If OK is being pressed. Uh, no, no, no. If OK is being triggered. There we go. OK, so here we need to get the location. Where are we? We're hitting OK, but we want to paint where we are. And this is going to be using our good friend, the region, again. So we'll start with region 11 here. It's very important that the top left corner be 11, and this is why I'm marking this as 1, 1. 
So you can think of this as the coordinates. So we have 1, 1. So 1, 2 would be x is 1 and y is 2. x is 1, y is 3. Here we have x is 2, y is 1. 2, 2, 2, 3. And 3, 1, 3, 2, 3, 3. And if you see here, I'm doing the same sort of thing, only going up to 6. Uh, you have a lot of variable, a lot of regions that you can use, so don't worry about it. Uh, also, if these are duplicated from the regions that we used in the graveyard, uh, that wouldn't be an issue either. That would be fine. No reason to... Like, it doesn't matter if you're contaminating these regions using them for multiple things in this uh, way that we set this up. All right. So since we have those regions done, uh, you can also just leave the regions up while you're doing other things if you want to. Uh, that's something I just discovered today. I uh, don't think I'll be using that feature a lot, but it's neat that it exists, I suppose. All right, so, uh, OK button. What are we doing with this? Well, first, we're going to get the location. This is get location info, and we're going to store that in our region ID. I'm just using the same one as that graveyard statue puzzle, and we want the region ID. And we're going to store it. Uh, direct designation, no, no, no. Designation with variables. OK, so this is checking. Right, so we're storing it in the region ID variable, variable 5, and we're using those cursor X and cursor Y values to determine determine where we are. All right. Hmm. I feel like I need to test something again. Uh, I will cheat and just look here and see if I did what I did here. Press OK. Uh, OK, apparently that is going to work. I wasn't fully certain, but uh, I was a little bit concerned that the X and Y's would be different, but X and Y has been set, and then we've subtracted. We subtract from X and Y after the fact, but I guess that's fine. All right, so cursor X. As always with these things, if you're not sure if something's working or not, just test it, and if it works, then it's fine. If it works, don't ask questions. All right, so cursor X, we're going to set this to our region ID variable. And we're going to do the same thing with cursor Y. So now we have a two-digit number from 11 to 33 somewhere in that range. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take cursor X and we're going to divide it by 10. And when you divide something in RPG Maker, you actually lose the remainder. So 11 divided by 10 equals 1. 20, uh, 20 but divided by 10 equals 2. 21 divided by 10 also equals 2. So by dividing by 10, what we're getting here is we're getting the first value, the x value. So this is where our location is. Likewise, with y, we do modulo division, modular division here, mod 10. This is going to divide. So we take 21 divided by 10. That would be 2 remainder 1. We ditch the 2 and we keep the remainder. So that's the difference between divide and mod. So we keep the remainder, which in this case is going to be the second digit, or the y value. And that's why those regions were really important. Next, we're going to control switch, and we're just going to tell the game that we are now painting. We're going to uh, wait for 12 frames, and that should be enough time to do all the painting that we need to do. All right. So that's the OK button. Uh, under the OK button, we're now going to check. We finished our painting. So did we win? Is the puzzle solved? Well, if paint check equals zero, then we're done. And in that situation, we're going to transfer the player just to leave the puzzle area. 
and I'm gonna, you know, you could do another room if you're transferring between rooms. I'm just gonna put it on the carpet for the sake of the example so that we can see what's going on. Uh, I have a weight in here just because if you have a door or chest or um, spikes triggering or something, you transfer the player, wait very briefly so they have a chance to be on the screen before you start animating things. That's what this waits for. And then we are no longer painting. So since we are no longer painting, we're going to turn that off. And we're going to say, congrats, you beat the first painting puzzle. Turn that on. And that's going to be the trigger for various things to happen. So in this case, I have my spikes go down. All right, I think that was it for that. Excellent. And let's uh, get the resets set up as well. So this uh, paint switch, we're not going to worry about that for now. That's going to be under the painting square event. But before we get to that, let's just get our reset working. Uh, we're going to use page up, which is Q in, uh, in MZ. I believe in MV, that is A. Uh, pressed or triggered, it shouldn't really matter in this case. We'll go triggered again. And this is just going to kind of do the same thing as the paint, only this time we're doing a reset instead. Just wait for 12 frames, and then turn the reset off. And again, because we don't want the player to be stuck in the puzzle for forever, we're going to transfer them. And I guess I have an animation wait in here, probably not necessary. And we are not painting, so let's say painting is done, but we are not complete. So this we can test right away, actually. So let's just test that and make sure that's working. So here we do this. And if we hit Q, well, now we're down here. So we've managed to successfully get out of the event. And you can make this a little bit nicer by having that text, like, are you sure you wish to leave? Yes, no. And if they say yes, then you do this. Uh, I would recommend doing something like that. But for the tutorial, that's not necessary. I'm just not going to hit Q ever again for the rest of this tutorial. All right, so the painting square, our final event, and the biggest one. All right, I'm going to put the coordinates here. This is just to make it easier for me to track which event is where. Uh, you don't need to name your events, but it's probably a good idea. So this one has six pages. So let's start from the beginning. Page one, do nothing. Well, not quite. Uh, you actually do need, where is it? I think it's under statues. I've got my various graphics that I've added for this. So we're gonna use this. Uh, this exists just to be, while you are not painting, while you're not painting, this is what the tile looks like. I think I had the tiles paint, uh, painted underneath here anyway, so it's a bit redundant, but if you had just grass under here or something, this would um, put this image over top of it instead. If you wanted a blank image that wasn't any of your colors, you could put something else here as well. Uh, but that's what this is. All right. So first page. Oh, this is green, the first color, the, de the starting color. Painting, color one, do nothing. Okay, we're done, easy. Second page. Well, we switched to blue. This happens, oh, I can say we're done, we're not done. This is when we're painting, there we go. Second page also when we're painting. But self so J is on, we've turned blue. Third page. In painting. This is self-switch B for red. Uh, there we go. Alright. Very important that all of these are not auto-run or parallel. You don't want them doing anything, you just want them to be there showing the player what their state is. So that's what these first four pages are dealing with. 
Page five is where all of the work happens, so we'll leave it for last. Page six, this is if we have painting reset going on. Uh, you can put an image here or not, up to you. I'm just going to use this again. And this is a parallel process. We want this to run as soon as the cursor tells it that painting reset has been toggled. We then want to go in here and just set self switch A off and self switch B off. So next time we start the puzzle, we'll be beginning with our blank state. We aren't going to have all these blues and reds. All right. So the actual process here, this is going to happen when we are updating the image. This is what my paint switch is. So we're currently applying color to our canvas. And is that the only thing I needed for switches? Looks like it. Uh, this has to be running in parallel because we will be in the cursor when this is activated, similar to with the reset state. Uh, here, while it's updating, the entire canvas will look like this. Uh, I just use this default thing again, but you could have another color, uh, something that's not used in the puzzle, just so that the entire canvas looks the same instead of all looking blank. Uh, you can really put whatever you want here. It doesn't terribly matter. All right. So for this one, well, conditional branch. Variable. Cursor x. If it's equal to 1. Uh, whoops, that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to put it in here. Make it cursor y. So if cursor x equals 1 and cursor y equals 1, so if we have the fire on this position here, then we do something. All right, and we're just going to set it to cycle between the three colors. So we're going to start with conditional branch if, no, 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 self switch. If A is off and B is off, this is the case if we are on our default color, this is green, then we're going to turn A on. So we switch from green to blue. And jump to label. Done. This is uh, the reason for that is because the next thing that we're going to do is in here we want this one. If self switch A is on. So if we're blue. Now, if we don't have this label, what's going to happen is we're going to calculate this, we're going to turn blue, and then we're immediately going to see, oh, we are blue, and then we're going to trigger whatever's in here. Uh, that should be a conditional branch. Okay. Yeah, so we'll switch that. So we don't want to do that. So instead, we're just going to do here, switch A on. And if A is on, well, turn A off, turn B on. So it's switched from blue to red. And again, jump to label done. And finally, Uh, we'll be here. I guess we don't really need a variable here, but we're going to turn B on. So this is if we're red. What do we do? Well, we turn it off. And this switches us back to green because A and B are both off at this point. And then jump to done. Yeah, and this didn't need to be an if statement because we're only getting here if we're not green or blue, but it doesn't matter either way. All right, then at the very bottom here, let's just put our label done. So once we've calculated something, we jump to here, we skip all the rest of the code. It's a very handy thing, labels. All right, so underneath this label, then, we're now going to call a common event. And this is where we had these things set up before. So what is this particular tile looking for? 
do we want to be green, do we want to be blue, or do we want to be red? Let's say we want to be green. So that means that this tile is green here in our reference. So we check that, and then we're done. However, there's a problem, which is that this label, uh, we don't want to run this outside of X and Y being one. Like we only want it to run if the cursor is in the right, right position. Otherwise, our numbers are going to get all messed up and the puzzle will be uh, really bad. It won't be solvable. So to fix this problem and make it so that we only run this event if we are inside cursor X and cursor Y in the appropriate values, which means we've gone jump, we've jumped to the label. We're going to create a new jump here, jump to label. And this, I think I called processing. Uh, no, I called it process. What? Hmm, there's a problem there. Call it process and processing. That's not going to work. They have to be the same. Okay. So jump to label process, and then here we're just going to put a label process. It's very important that you check that these are the same because you can't pull it out from a menu. You have to type it in. If it's not the same, things will go wrong. So the purpose of this is if we've done any of these things, then we check for green. But if we haven't done any of these things, then we're just going to skip skip the event entirely. All right. And then I have a wait, just in case. Yeah. So this way it shouldn't double process the player's spamming buttons or anything like that. We have a 12. Uh, no, no, the issue is that cursor has a 12 second wait or 12 frame wait. So here we're going to have a 12 frame wait as well, just so that it only processes this one time every time you do the input. OK. And everything should be working. So let's test it and see what goes wrong. Hopefully nothing. Okay, so if I press Z, nothing happens because oh, something went wrong. Okay, well, that's something to check. Yeah, I press Z and then it zooms to there for some reason. Okay, I'll look into that in a moment. However, if I'm here and press Z, also nothing happens. Hmm. Okay, this is probably the thing that I was concerned about, and I was trying to figure out why it wasn't an issue here. Alright, because if we do this... If I look at all of this, we're just... Like, I don't care about pressing these buttons. Region ID, region ID, this event. Hmm. Okay, well, it's working here, but it's not working here. worrying. Hmm. I feel like I wanted to do this again in here. Like this is what I thought was missing. So you have control, put the offset, and then Here, right? We do... No, no, no. But this is going to be weird because, okay, rather than doing, rather than guessing, because guessing is a terrible idea, what we're instead going to do is get location info, and then here we're going to go, this is a useful troubleshooting technique, variable, and is it 12? No. It's not 12. It's 10 and 11. Okay. 
So go 10, variable 11. That. So if we preview that, we're going to get our coordinates. And we hit OK. So let's see what's going on here. So hit OK. We're at 0, 0. That's not good. We're still at 0, 0. So every time I hit OK, it's resetting. Okay, where do we have... Here, we set it to 1-1 one, one by default, auto run, and then we're done. So at the beginning, it should actually be 1-1. One, one. Like I, if I hit X at the very beginning before I've moved at all, I should be at cursor X equals 1, cursor Y equals 1. Because we haven't messed with it at all, because we haven't done any movement. So we get region, region ID which is going to be at 1-1. One, one. Hmm. Well, we don't want it to be at 1-1. One, one. We want it to be at 4-2. Yeah, so this has to be here. Right? But I don't do it in the other one, and the other one works. I don't know. Okay, we're still at zero, zero. One, three. Zero, zero. Yeah, okay, something is going on here. I'm getting... My variable is getting eaten by something that it shouldn't be getting eaten by. So... All right, uh, looking at all of this again, did I set this up wrong? These minuses. Yeah, I have the minuses in here. Plus, plus one, minus, plus, minus, minus. And then here, this event. Oh, did I not do? Not set an allocation. Variable ID, okay. Info type, region ID. X and Y. designation by character okay that that makes more sense why why was I doing it why was I putting these variables in hmm yeah because of course it's in the wrong spot because I was subtracting like this is why I was confused by this earlier subtracting Subtracting the value, and then it wasn't where I thought it was, but then it worked on the other one. Well, it worked on the other one because I wasn't using these values to grab the, uh, the cursor x, cursor y. I was just using the event's position. All right, apply. So now we hit, well, still zero, zero. That's not great. So something's still going on. Okay, we're still stuck within the grid. Zero, zero. So something is still wrong, unfortunately. That isn't the fix. Cursor X 
equals the region ID variable. All right, well, copy, paste. And region ID is five. All right, what's going on here? Zero. Zero, zero. Zero, zero, zero. So region ID is not working. That's what's going on here. Why is region ID not working? What am I doing here? Region ID, region ID, this event. Region ID, region ID, this event. Okay. Here. What the heck? How did that happen? Region ID, region ID, this event, not cursor Y. Okay. Sorry about this, this kind of became a mess. I guess that's what timestamps are for. Well, I'm watching me do troubleshooting. Okay, 11, there we go, one more. 33, 33, okay. One, three, three, one. And as you can see, if we hit X over here, we, we cycle through the uh, colors. Okay, so it's working now. No, troubleshooting is important to know how to do too, I suppose. It's part of the process. Anyway, so we have this working. But what we want is a brush that's more than just the one tile. If you want just the one tile, then what we've got set up here will work. However, I want to do it like this, where it's every time you press, it's going to be the middle, and it's also going to do above and to the right. So in order to get that set up, we actually have a little bit more work to do here. Uh, first of all, now that we've tested the text, we don't need these anymore. Let's get rid of those. So what's happening here? If X is 1 and Y is 1, then we're triggering, which is good. We're over top of it. However, with this shape, if we are below it, so if X is 1 and Y is 2, we should also be triggering this. And unfortunately, the way to do that is just to copy that whole block, but check here with the other, change the variables here. So one and two. And all you have to do is change those numbers. So it's actually not that bad. It's just that this gets really long. It'd be a lot worse if you had to change the common event. But now, Okay, as you can see, it's working fine here. If we go here, also transforming it. But if we hit a button on any other square, it doesn't do it. Excellent. So we have a working event here. So now it's just a matter of copying this for each square. So we go here. This is x is 2, but y is 1. So we're going to go 2, 1. And we just have to change this. And all we've done is we've increased the x value by one. Over here, we increase the x value by one. Here, we increase the x value by one. Okay. But there is another, uh, the corners, the edges are gonna be kind of weird. Uh, but with this one, with this shape, if we're here, we want it to go to the right as well. So we are actually gonna have to copy paste. One more time. And that's going to be on 1-1. One, one. So 1-1, one, one. we'll just do a little sanity check here. We have 1-1, one, 2-1, one, two, one, and 2-2 two, two are three places that should trigger this, right? Because if we're here, it's to the right. If we're here, it's above. And if we're here, we're right on it. 
So one, one, two, one, two, two. Looks good. All right, copy, paste. Three, one. Well, we updated X by one, so we just have to update X by one here. And we have three cases, and they're all accounted for. Excellent. All right. Before we go any further, let's just test this and make sure that the top row is working the way we expect it to. So if I go here with this kind of a shape, I'm expecting to have two of them change. Two of them do. Same here. Two. But here, it'll just be the one. Likewise, from beneath, it should only be the one right above it for each case. Looks good. And we're starting to see how we can get the puzzle stuff going on, where we overlap on top of it, and two blues is a red, and it just does some does some cool stuff. All right, so we basically got it working. Now we're going to copy you and go down, and you are going to be one, two. Well, we increased y by one, so we increase y by one. Like, this part is not that bad. All right. And that should be all we need to do here. Um, it is important which, which event you copy. I'm copying the one above it because Y is increasing by one. So to double check this one, it should be triggered off of itself, which is two, one and off of, sorry, off of one, two rather, and off of one, three. So one, two and one, three. Make sure that's what we've got. One, two. One, three. Looks good. All right, so we're going to copy from above and go down. This is going to be two, two. Again, we increased y by one. Increased y by one. Increased by y by one. And this is why we're doing a three by three and not a six by six for the tutorial. Because this part can take a while. And at this point, I'm going to assume everything's just kind of working until I've got the entire grid filled in. And then I will test it again. To, and I'll test every square to make sure I didn't screw up any of these numbers. So here we're going down. It's going to be 1, 3. So y increased by 1. y increased by 1. However, you'll notice. A four. Four is not possible on a three by three grid. So we can actually just delete that. That'll be fine. That's here. This is two, three. 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 And four is not possible, so we'll delete that. And on three, three, same one last time, three, three. And I recommend going through this process for each one of these in the exact same order, doing the exact same things in the exact same way, because that way you kind of develop a muscle memory. And if you do something wrong, you will feel like you did something wrong. And then you can probably catch yourself. All right, so we have everything set up. It should all be working. So now we're just going to test uh, each of these squares by hitting the action button three times on it and see if we get the, the effect that we're looking for. And it looks like we are. Looks good to me. Okay. So one final thing I'm going to test here. We've completely filled it in. I am actually going to hit Q again. Okay. And it did reset them. Good. So that was the final thing to check. Okay, so actually I need to be in there again. So now comes the fun part. Once you have everything working, you get to actually make the puzzle. So here we get to make a series of inputs and then we will remember what we did and copy that over to here. So... Kind of just do whatever you want. You don't have to make it symmetrical to you. 
Uh, let's go with that pattern. So we've got red in these three corners, and then blue in those two, and all the orthogonals are empty. So three reds and two blues. Okay. So that's what we're trying to make. Uh, let's go back over here. Uh, with our carpet. Okay. So I'm going to put these over here. So this is kind of a, a handy trick for mapping. Uh, if I just try to draw in here, I guess it's actually okay in this case because I don't have anything linked together. But what I'm doing is I'm shift right clicking and then I'm shift left clicking. And the reason that that's important is you copy with the right click and then you paste with the left click is because if they were adjacent, you would end up getting a pattern like this, which is fine, but that's not what I want. I want, I would want it to be like that. Uh, with the way that I've set this up so that they're very distinct squares. And that's just a useful mapping tri trick in general. Shift, right click, and then we're just going to left click to get rid of those. All right. And uh, these shadows, get rid of those. Okay. So that's the pattern that we want. We are almost done. We have two final things to do. First, how many differences are there between this and this? Oh, there are five tiles. So we want paint check. This value should be five. There are five things that need to change. And then we go in here, and this is why we set up these common events. This is not green. Whoops. It's space. We want this one to be red. Uh, this one is green. That's fine. Uh, this one... We're not checking if it's green. We're checking if it's blue. I don't know why hitting apply is just a habit I have. Hitting OK and hitting Apply are the same. Apply is just to save what you've done without leaving the uh, the menu. All right, this one was blue, I think. That's where we are. Yeah. And then two more reds. Okay, and everything should be working. And uh, that thing where I just kind of pasted the extra blue there when I was showing off the, uh, the mapping technique, uh, don't make your puzzle that way, because I'm pretty sure that would be impossible if I just added one extra blue tile, because we have a parity thing here with threes. Um, you can do individual ones by clicking the corners, but it's um, you could potentially make something that's not possible to solve, so don't do that. Play around with it on here, take a screenshot. If it's if it's bigger, take a screenshot so you can remember, and then copy that over to here. All right, so let's uh, play our game and see if we can make the puzzle actually work. All right, so that's the pattern I'm trying to make. Well, uh, the bottom left corner, the only possible way that can be read is to place two there. So like, there's a logic to this. These are actually kind of fun to solve. So here, if we want red in this corner, there's two things we can do. Right? We can either go on our current position, or we can go down here. Uh, but we know that this one has to be blank, and we're not going here again. So to make this blank, we have to go there again. But we can't go here a second time, because then there will be something here. So we have to do that. So it's just a, a simple logic problem. So we're kind of going to chase them around the same way. Okay, and we want blue in the center, and then blue. And hey, look. We had a matching pattern. Our... Uh, paint check went down to zero, and it just immediately kicked us out and said, uh, hey, congrats, you win. Well, I didn't say that, but that's, that's what the code would have done. So then in the cursor under here, this is where painting one would now be triggered. So you can now open the locked door that required painting one to be on, or the treasure chest appears that appears when painting one is on, or whatever. And you have a painting puzzle. Oh man, this thing was a, a lot of work to put together again, but uh, I'm pretty happy with the system and how it works out. Hopefully you can see how you could expand upon this. Uh, the framework that I have here would easily work if you wanted to add more colors, uh, although you probably want a consistent pattern. It also works for different brushes. Uh, I haven't uh, implemented it yet, but here it's uh, I'm going to have one. I'm going to have a pattern where the center square, where your cursor is, doesn't do anything, but it does each of the adjacent orthogonals. So four like that. And this is just going to be a line one, two, three. 
So you can change the brush shape. Uh, if you do change the brush shape, obviously you're going to have to change how these events work. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's it for painting restoration. Uh, glad that this one is done. I will see you next time for orb mazes.